Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I am a nurse practitioner amongst many other titles. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit more personally. And so as you can see from the title, this is the story of how I had a spinal cord injury and I had cancer before I turned 18 years old. So I definitely have a unique perspective on healthcare, being that I have been a patient for so many years of my life and will continue to be a patient for the rest of my life. I thought it would be interesting to share a kind of detailed description of what I have gone through personally and how ultimately it drove me to work in healthcare. And I've shared this story a couple of times or bits and pieces of this story on my channel here, but I've had some more followers and I haven't really I haven't really portrayed it in a way that I feel satisfied and I think it's just an important story to tell and it's what makes me who I am. So I'm just going to go over with you what it is that I went through and ultimately how I'm doing today. So I did have a spinal cord injury when I was two years old. I had a tumor in my spinal cord from C4 to T6. And so that's quite a large part of my spinal cord that was affected. It was technically tumors and cysts. And I was not diagnosed immediately. Instead, I was misdiagnosed for a little while. And it's essentially because if you're in healthcare, you know there's usually like, there's the horse and the zebra. Zebra is the off chance, the exception to the rule. Usually it's the worst case scenarios of a patient's health and the least likely of scenario. And so in my circumstance, I was the zebra. You know, I was the exception to the rule. My situation was abnormal, but I was misdiagnosed. And so when I was two years old, I started tilting my head to, I think it was the left, but I started tilting my head a lot. And initially they chalked it up to behavioral issues and just maybe being like shy, having some shy mannerisms. And then eventually as they noticed it really didn't stop, I was evaluated and they diagnosed me initially with torticollis, which is just tightening in the neck muscles. And so they sent me to physical therapy. And I had a lot of different techniques done where they would try and stretch out the neck muscles, but really nothing improved because that wasn't the problem. That wasn't what was going on. And then I ended up having some weakness in my left arm and I was taken again to be evaluated by a doctor and I was diagnosed with nursemaid's elbow, which if you're familiar, it's where that radial head slips out of place and it's quite common in children younger than three years old. It happens a lot of times, like if you're lifting a young child up by their arms and it just kind of slips out of place. And they will present with what appears to be like paralysis in their arm and they're unable to use it until it's uh, reduced, until it's put back into place. And once it's put back into place, you should regain function. But yeah, I was diagnosed with nursemaid's elbow and honestly, I'm not 100% sure how that came to be because my weakness didn't correct after whatever maneuvers they did i still had that weakness very shortly after that is when i started to develop total paralysis i was sleeping and when i woke up i was pretty flaccid in my body not that i can remember any of this this is what i have heard from my parents like i said i was two years old but essentially i had no control over my body everything was very limp and so they immediately knew something was very wrong and rushed me to the hospital which is where i had my first image done and I had an MRI done and it showed you know I had those tumors and cysts throughout my spinal cord and at this point before they could take me into surgery they had to pump me up with antibiotics and steroids I was pretty sick and so they did that before taking me into surgery and I believe the surgery was about nine hours long and I was treated at University of Michigan Hospital which is a phenomenal hospital and at this time my parents were given an option they were given an option to either place a rod in my spine or they were given the option to fuse my spine using only my vertebrae. At this time, I was actually the first patient that they had done this surgery on at U University of Michigan. And it is where they actually used only my spine to fuse everything together. So I have no metal rod or anything in my spine, but I do have a fused spine and so I have very low, limited mobility in my neck. I was a success story and we'll get to that, but really considering what we know the detrimental effects could have been 
with that type of injury to my spinal cord. So the prognosis when I was going into surgery was unclear. The tumor itself was benign. I did not have cancer in my spine, but the prognosis was unclear of my function, if I would regain function. Coming out of surgery, I had to lay on my back for quite a long time and I had to have a back brace on. The back brace I had on for months, but initially I had to lay on my back and I was so pumped up with steroids, they had to strap me down and I would pull this arm fighting against the restraints because of all the steroids and trying to sit up. And I was just post spinal cord surgery and I was supposed to be laying flat. Apparently it was quite a fiasco trying to get me to lay flat. This was two-sided. One, they were happy to see that I had movement, you know, but also scary because trying to keep a two-year-old that had just had a spine surgery still is, you know. Anyway, so I did regain function immediately in my arms and below everything above my waist but it was unclear of what function i would be regaining in my legs spoiler alert i did not regain function in my left leg i do have paralysis of most of my left leg and it's really hard for me to pinpoint exactly where the paralysis is but i can't i can't lift my foot so i have foot drop on that left side and I really have limited mobility and how I can function even with my thigh and my calf. I mean, it's all very limited, but it's completely paralyzed, I would say, from my knee down. Ultimately, it has shaped my entire life. I do walk, but I walk differently, and I use a device always to assist me. At home, it's easier. I can take off devices if I need to, but it's more difficult for me, and you'll rarely see me do that. So I lived at Mott's Children's Hospital for three months after this, which is through University of Michigan, where I did a lot of rehabbing. Again, I had to stay in that back brace throughout my whole hospital stay, and then for months after at home, I have lots of pictures of me in my back brace. I obviously didn't love it. It was very uncomfortable. It was it would rub on my chin, and it'd rub at the back of my head, so I had like a little bit of a bald spot back there. It was uncomfortable, and I was a kid, and I wanted to not be in a back brace. And so I really liked the Ninja Turtles at the time, which... Obviously, they're still cool. So we would call it my turtle shell. It was just something that stuck and helped me, I guess, cope with having to wear a back brace at such a young age. But anyway, I lived at Mott's Shoulder Hospital, and I did a lot of rehabbing. Lots and lots and lots of rehabbing. My whole life now turned around. It definitely just kind of set me back physically. Children are so resilient, and I was very fortunate because all spinal cord injuries are different. But what I always struggled with and will always struggle with, unless they come up with some sort of cure for spinal cord injuries and paralysis, I will always struggle with walking. Anyway, so when I was at the rehab, at the physical therapy, uh, worked with me for so long and basically told my parents eventually that this is as good as it's gonna get. And so I went home. I went home with two braces on my legs, actually, at, at the time. Uh, I had the two, like, from the knee down, those big old braces, kind of like Forrest Gump. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> so I really resonate with Forrest, by the way. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding, but um, I'm laughing about it because it's funny. But what was I saying? Brit. I did have some weakness in my right leg, but I regained complete functioning. I'm very strong in every other way aside from my left leg, which I have obvious weakness and deficits. As time went on, I stopped wearing the brace on my right leg because I didn't need it. I regained full function. However, like I said, I did not regain function in my left leg at this time because I did not want to be different than any of my friends going in through elementary school, middle school, and high school, I wanted to just pretend like I was the same as everybody else, even though I very clearly wasn't. One thing that really stood out to me was a brace. I hated that I had to wear a brace, and so I didn't. I stopped wearing my brace in elementary school, and my body accommodated to my, my walk and my gait and my functioning. And I eventually, over time, because I had such bad spasticity in that left leg, I ended up having permanent plantar flexion of my foot. I was trying to think of how to say that. My Achilles tendon tightened up so bad with my spasticity that I had like permanent foot drop. I couldn't even put my foot into a flat shoe anymore or into some sort of brace. And so I ended up needing to get surgery and I had this surgery actually twice. They did it once when I was younger because I was having so much spasticity around seven or eight years old, although it wasn't in that permanent fixture at that time. I didn't have, what's the word? Not rigor mortis. 
almost like a contracture. At this time, when I was like seven or eight, when I had it the first time, I didn't have a contracture, but I had a lot of spasticity and they saw it as a possible problem. And then fast forward to when I was 17 years old, I had been walking around without a brace for so long and I had that contracture of my foot. I had to have the surgery again. And so essentially what this surgery is, is where they clip your Achilles tendon to put it back into that 90 degree like this and then they cast you. I had to be casted for quite some time and the goal was to be able to get me back into some sort of brace. But I will forever remember after going back and getting my cast taken off and when they had me bare weight on my left leg after this, it was the worst pain to this day that I can remember affiliated with what I've gone through. I just remember thinking that I felt like my leg was going to just snap in half. So I don't know if I said this yet, but that surgery on my Achilles tendon, that was when I was 16 years old. And so I was a junior in high school at the time. So after that surgery, I was able to use a brace and I used a brace for a long time. And that's kind of, you know, where the spinal cord injury story ends. There's a lot in between. I've had Botox injections in my legs for spasticity. I've had countless MRIs, although I probably haven't had like an MRI of my spine since before I was 18 years old. I mean, it's been a very long time. I've pretty much just never went back. I actually should go back and have just like a reassessment and get an MRI of my spine again and make sure that everything is okay. But considering I do quite well, I live a very full life, I get around, I work out, I take care of my kids, I work as a nurse or a nurse practitioner now, I'm doing okay. And ultimately, it's what got me into healthcare. And what was the first stepping stone? And before I get into what happened my 17th year of life, which is just another example of my poor luck in healthcare as a patient, but before I get into that, I remember specifically when I was being reevaluated over the years for my injury, I was, like I said, I was seen at University of Michigan and I was seen by some of the best doctors around. One doctor in particular, she was a female neurologist who had a very large height discrepancy in her legs. And so one of her shoes had like a lift probably about this big. And not to mention she, again, like I said, was a female neurologist at University of Michigan. So me as a child seeing this woman in practice, this woman in charge with a disability, she was just such a wonderful example to me as a child that I can still do the stuff I want to do. And so I just wanted to point out that that really resonated with me and to this day stuck with me. So like I said, all that stuff happened, all that fun stuff happened. And then when I was 17 years old, I had another round of bad luck, another situation. I was dating a guy who ended up being very toxic for my teenage self, cheated on me like left and right, and I kept taking him back. And this particular day, we were arguing in his car and I had leaned back in his chair and kind of did one of these. And he's like, kind of doing one of these. He's like, there's something wrong with your neck. I like pulled the car mirror down and I was looking and I had this whole part of my neck was very bulging, more than a golf ball. Initially, they wanted to do an ultrasound. They had very low suspicion that it was anything to be concerned of. They thought it was just a goiter. The ultrasound obviously showed something to them that was suspicious. And so they decided to do a biopsy. And so I had to have a biopsy of my neck. It was a very large hollow needle. <laughs> and they had to take tissue out of my neck and I remember being very scared. Again, I was 17 years old. They had to send that off to pathology. During this time, this isn't even really important to the story, but like I said, I was, I was in this really toxic relationship with this boyfriend. This was March, so this was spring break senior year. So we decided to take off to Florida. We drove down there and I, in the meantime, I found out the result came back that it was in fact malignant. And so I had to go back home. I had to have radiation, radioactive iodine, which if you've ever done that, they literally will put the iodine, the radioactive iodine in a canister, within a canister, with another canister, and they put a straw in it. They're wearing PPE as they give this to you and they leave the room before you can drink it. Once you drink that radioactive iodine, you're put in quarantine for a couple days. And then I had to have surgery. They went in and they removed half of my thyroid. They really intended to keep part of my thyroid. They took that thyroid, they sent that to pathology. And the results came back that it was worse than they had initially thought. And they were worried about the cancer metastasizing. And so I had to repeat everything. I had to do the radiation, radioactive iodine, and surgery to remove the other half 
again. And there is actually a whole other traumatic story in that itself, but I'm not going to put it on this video, maybe in the future if I'm feeling extremely vulnerable. But it was definitely a very trying time in my life being at the ripe age of 17. And so when they told me that I had to come back in to have this all the treatments again and that second surgery again. I had already missed so much school at this time. I essentially stopped going. It was my second semester of my senior year. It's frustrating for me to even think back now. I just stopped going to school and I eventually dropped out of high school. So I did not graduate with my class. I did go back obviously and that's a whole other story in itself too. Anyway, so I had the other part of my thyroid removed and from here on out, I have to supplement with levothyroxine or Synthroid, which is the thyroid hormone that my body no longer makes because I do not have any thyroid. I get blood work every now and then. I'm supposed to see endocrinology. I haven't seen them in a few years. I'm a really bad patient. I'm just going to put it out there. I am a good nurse practitioner. I am a crap patient. I feel okay, but you know. So now I'm going to show you my scars. Well, I'm not going to show you all of them. That's my thyroid scar, so nothing in there. No thyroid in there, I should say. So don't be alarmed. I do have tattoos. So yeah, that's my scar. It's pretty big. People ask me quite often, what happened to me? <laughs> You know, I've definitely been through my share of stuff. And ultimately, like I said already, this is what drove me to work in healthcare. Being uh, on the patient side, seeing that female neurologist with a disability, just everything that I experienced really drew me to healthcare. It feels like a calling to me. And not every circumstance is affected by what I've been through, but I've had a lot of patient interactions where my experiences have definitely shaped me and allowed me to better empathize and better connect with my patients. And I feel like they feel it too. I don't know if that makes sense. Generally, people are very apt to open up to me. They feel more comfortable with me. And they know that I really can empathize and relate having been on that side. I haven't just read the textbooks. I'm not saying you have to go through all of these healthcare related traumatic events to be able to be a good healthcare or an empathetic healthcare provider, but it definitely has shaped my bedside manner. I can't see myself doing anything else after everything that I've been through. So I think that's going to be all for today's video. I covered a lot. I could be here for hours talking, and so I'm going to. I'm going to end it here. Let me know uh, in the comments if you have anything to say. Make sure you like the video. Subscribe to the channel. It really does help me out. And I always appreciate the support. Until next time, don't forget to learn something new every day. And I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye.